situations. Okay, well, you're probably asking to how does this sort of thing happen? And that was a question that I was interested in. Um, we can say, well, first of all, at a certain level of ability, learners begin to transfer their first language, pragmatic knowledge of functions, to second language, pragmatic performance. Um, in other words, we're talking about L1 to L2 transfer. And this also happens because there's assumptions. The learner assumption is the universality in the way that speech acts or functions are performed. OK, well, that makes sense, because if they haven't really actually learned about uh, functions in the language classroom, if they're not explicitly taught, then of course it would be simple for learners to assume um, that the speech acts that they think are, or let's say the way that they, they utter speech acts in their language are going to be um, appropriate for the second language. Um, and also because they, if, it's not func if it's not focused on in the language classroom that there is a difference, then they won't even know this. They'll just assume it. And they're doing the best they can under the circumstances. Third point is that the ELT course materials, um, there's a minimum explicit input in terms of, of how to perform functions. You do have them um, in, in current language te textbooks, but they seem to be, seem to be very, very, um, uh, very minimal. Uh, for instance, requests tend to be focused, tend to focus only on requesting telephone numbers or uh, requesting a room in a hotel. And the word request itself is not really well defined. Same thing with the disagreements. The disagreements is very little. Even though most of the language textbooks are, uh, have a communicative approach to them, there's plenty of examples of disagreements. There's plenty of examples of requests, suggestions, complaints. But they're not very explicit. And if there is some explicit reference to them, it tends to be um, very, very general. Um, so the thing is that we need to have more of a reference to the lingual cultural differences in expressing requests, in expressing disagreements, as well as all the other functions, as suggestions, uh, apologies, and the like. OK, so um, so far I've described the water that our learners might be uh, drowning in. Now, of course, we need to find some ways to help them out. And here's some suggestions that I have, and that is this pragma pragmatics approach uh, to culture and language training. This is something that we as language teachers could integrate into our language training. And that is, first of all, we need to sensitize our learners on the cultural differences in the performance of functions. Um, in order to do that, we need to look at the cultural norms. For instance, uh, English speakers tend to use more tentativeness. And I, when I say English speakers, I'm talking about, of course, Americans. I'd like to be um, very specific on that because I don't want to overgeneralize. But if I'm talking about Americans and, let's say, even English speakers, British English speakers, tentativeness when requesting is a, show, uh, is a sign that I'm trying not to impose on somebody else. Whereas in German culture, clarity is extremely important, so uh, an important aspect of German politeness is to show that I'm very clear, so I have to be, um, make it understood that I'm requesting, so I would be more direct about it. And that among American speakers of English, uh, there's a much a stronger focus on agreement. If we're sitting at a table and uh, dis discussing something, uh, and a decision has to be made, we all know that there's going to be differences of opinions, um, but one tries to move very quickly to agreement, so they focus more on that, and you can see that in the style of communication. Whereas for German speakers, disagreement is expected, and there's a longer phase of disagreement that is explicitly expressed at the table, which helps to one to move into agreement. So these things have to be understood so that people realize um, this is the culture. So what Bao Chuan said earlier, that um, it's important for learners to understand their own culture in order to understand how they differ from the people that they're interacting with. Then we have also contextualized functions. I think this is extremely important. For instance, disagreeing with one a client's suggestion is uh, versus disagreeing with a colleague's suggestion. Um, how one goes about doing this and the kind of language that's used um, is often different. Um, and then also the fourth point here is the pragmatic meaning accompanying grammar. Um, in many of the things that I found in my data, uh, learners used very good grammar, but they didn't realize that the grammar they used for the pragmatic expressions had a meaning that might not be what they were trying to, to send. For instance, if you say, I'm asking, as opposed to, may I ask? And of course, lear learners, when they're learning English, they ha especially Germans, uh, they have difficulties with the tenses. So um, if I'm asking, and I'm doing it right now, I guess I have to use the, the, the 
continuous uh, uh, formula because I'm doing it right now, not realizing that by saying I'm asking, using a performative verb, they've actually uttered a command or an order. Or for instance, another interesting thing, I would do X versus I would like to do X or I would like you to do X. Um, I would do, it happens because learners sometimes forget the word like in between as they're speaking. It's just a slip up. But they need to re recognize that this happens quite often and I have many examples of this in my own data. And finally, um, the use of adverbs or adjectives. Uh, we as teachers need to, to realize that when we're teaching these things from a grammatical point of view, um, that Words like possibly are also used to soften it, to tentivize um, a request or a disagreement. For instance, could you possibly send me the data as opposed to could you send me the data? By adding possibly, I'm actually tentivizing it, making it sound a little politer. These t things tend to be taught as grammar, um, as a grammar ex exercise, when actually they have a, um, a pragmatic value as well and um, cultural. Okay. Um, now what I'd like to do is to present you the last two slides, um, just as sort of an exercise to give you an idea of what you could be doing in the language classroom. This would be a learner awareness exercise, uh, a contextualized scenario, and imagine the following situation. Uh, you and your colleague are preparing a company presentation for a group of potential clients. Your American colleague thinks it would be a good idea for the presentation team to wear dirndl, uh, lederhosen and dirndl as a way to focus on German culture and you disagree. Um, this situation, by the way, is a true situation. It was presented to me in a, um, in a culture and communication seminar when I asked what kind of difficulties do you have, uh, have you experienced, and this situation came up. Uh, the German wanted to know why it is that Americans think that Germans run around in lederhosen and, and dirndl all the time. And of course, he didn't like the idea of presenting his company, or let's say presenting the company in that kind of clothing, because he came from Frankfurt, and that kind of clothing is more common in, in Bavaria. And even still, perhaps in a Bavarian company might say, I don't really want to present my company in this kind of clothing. So what could you do? Um, here's an awareness raising discussion questions. The first one you could do is uh, have the learners sit down and consider all of the different ways one could disagree in that situation, as many as possible. You could have them do it as, as, group, as a group work. Then you have the group organize the list in terms of appropriate to inappropriate. Um, and then the next point, how do the choices of words help convey appropriate to inappropriate acts of disagreeing? How do these acts differ or resemble uh, your native language? Uh, would your list change if the addressee was a friend, boss, or a client? Um, these things are important because it helps learners to become more aware of how they're using the language, and it also helps you as a teacher to recognize uh, the learner's meta-pragmatic knowledge for how to, do these, uh, to deal with these situations. Um, then, the last point, compare your list with your teacher's list. Uh, this is an important thing. If you do this exercise, the teacher also has metapragmatic knowledge. And it doesn't matter what, which, which culture you come from, whether you're, in, um, let's say, brought up as a first language speaker of English or not. It doesn't matter because you have your own idea of how you would deal with these situations. And by comparing your list with your students' lists, give them an opportunity to recognize, let's say, uh, cultural differences as well as personal differences and how they would deal with the situation. Because naturally, on one level, we've got the cultural aspect, but we also have the individual aspect as well. But people become, or the learners become more aware of how we use language to do things, in other words, to request or suggest or disagree. Then. With this thing, with the teacher's list, how, you can ask the learners, how does your teacher's list compare to yours? Are there any disagreeing examples you would never use and why? Anyway, this sort of exercise here I think would be helpful in the language classroom, um, as I said, to get learners to be, become more aware of the cultural aspect as well as their own personal choices for dealing with these situations. Anyway, that wraps up what I have to say, and um, thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the, the next part of this webinar. Thank you very much.